Good. I think we are live now. Uh, apologies for the somewhat late start. Uh, my name is Paul Shear. I'm a research fellow at the Mossadal Romani Center for Business and Government at Harvard Uni uh, University's Kennedy School. Uh, we're missing a, a few of the panelists. A couple of people were having trouble uh, getting getting on. So we don't yet live in a perfect uh, IT world, um, but we do have um, the Honourable Minister, uh, Edward Chelsea, Minister of State for the Protection of Entrepreneurship from the Republic of Albania, a very interesting title. I think, Minister, you may be the only such minister in the world that is given the task of protecting entrepreneurship. Uh, so we look forward to hearing a little bit about uh, what you do we do have a couple of other panelists that were definitely slated to join us. Um, uh, former President of Ecuador, uh, the Honorable Rosalia Atiega, and also the Honorable Michael Brown, the Shadow Senator uh, from the US to the District of Columbia. A very interesting position, uh, being the Shadow Senator for DC. Um, hopefully, they'll join us, but. Um, if not, we have a little bit more elbow room to have a more extensive uh, discussion. So um, why don't we just uh, jump into this? So this, uh, I think probably a number of panels have talked about uh, the implications of COVID-19. Uh, the, the panel, This panel is on the topic of redesigning for post-COVID equitable growth. Uh, of course, with, there is an assumption there that we will get into a post-COVID world. Uh, it's not exactly over yet, um, but hopefully uh, it, it will be before too long. Uh, and so the question is, can that growth, how can that growth, what will that growth look like? Can that growth be made um, more uh, equitable or will it result in increasing inequities and inequalities? And what needs to redesign, I think, captures the idea of we just can't afford to sit back here and wait and let it all happen as if it was business as usual. What are some of the changes that need to be made uh, to various systems, whether they're government systems, administration, corporate systems, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, educational systems, societal, political systems? How can we make the system more robust uh, for the next time? Um, I'm an economist. Uh, that's what I do for a living. So let me just frame the discussion before I bring in uh, Minister Chelsea with a, a little bit of economic data and make a few points about this economic impact of COVID-19. And the first point I would make is that to an economist looking at this, um, and, you know, the economists have taken a little bit of a backseat to the epidemiologists, but as an economist looking at this, I mean, it is just the most amazing negative shock to economic activity, GDP, that I've ever seen. Um, now, I cut my teeth in Japan, and I went through the Japanese uh, long lost years of the uh, lost decade in the 1990s with deflation, etc. cetera. Um, I was at the coalface of the global financial crisis and Great Recession as chief economist at various institutions, one of which was Lehman Brothers. Um, but this, this takes the cake in terms of the damage that is being done in the short term to ac economic activity. Um, the IMF is just about to come out with its updated world economic outlook in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but if we look at the, the numbers from June and compare them to January of this year, between January and June, mm -hmm. the IMF downgraded its forecast for this year's global economic growth by 8.2 percentage points from 3.3% positive growth to minus 4.9% growth, negative growth. That's just an unbelievable swing in global growth in, in such a short period. So that's a just, a, I think, something to have at the back of our minds. This is really serious stuff, of course, from a public policy health point of view, but it's also incredibly damaging to the economy. Um, that might make for a stronger recovery at some point, we're seeing a little bit of that at the moment, but we're not out of the woods. The second point I'd just highlight in framing this discussion is that, uh, so far at least, this is a pandemic that has done the most damage to, looks like we have one of our panellists joining us, Senator Michael Brown. Uh, a little bit to, to you. I'm so, I'm so sorry for this, guys, but I've been trying to get on for 45 minutes. 
Right. The website won't let me on. So now I'm on FaceTime with my assistant who somehow has gotten on. So I'm, this I apologize and, and I, I forgo my opening statement. But no, please feel free to ask me anything. That's perfect. Uh, if you could hold it there without getting a sore arm, Senator Brown, uh, no need to apologize. Uh, you know, these things happen. But I, I love your ability to improvise. That is very impressive, indeed. Well, uh, it's really Karen's ability to improvise. <laughs> I was about to take a hammer to my computer. Well, it's great to have you on. Um, I'm just, I'm just. Uh, you can have your opening statement in a moment because I'm still just framing the discussion. But the, the second point that I was making is that this is a shock so far that has hit uh, more seriously in the advanced world rather than in the emerging markets or developing world. The third point, now, now that could change, and that's something that worries me a little bit, that are we just at the early stages of this in a global development? That's out of my expertise. But, um, you know, some countries went in early, suffered damage, tapering off. Others then have come in and been hit by COVID-19. I, I just, pr fingers crossed that, a continent like Africa, for example, which has got only 3% of global deaths so far, uh, that they do continue to dodge the bullet. Um, the third point I'd, I'd make is that looking particularly within economies, uh, this is an event that has really hit the uh, less skilled part of the population workforce, perhaps not as high uh, academic credentials and skills particularly through uh, unemployment, uh, but also through uh, not really being exposed to the upside or rebound that happened in financial markets. Now, just to give you an idea of this, again, I can't resist the temptation to give a number or two here as an economist. In the US, the unemployment rate in February was 3.5%. Two months later, it was 14.7%. So it went up 11.2 percentage points in just two months. We've never seen such a deterioration in the in the labor market. If you go back to the financial crisis, the unemployment rate just prior to the crisis went up from 6.1%, reached a peak of 10%, but that took 14 months. 4% 4 percentage point increase in 14 months. Now we've had 11% in just two months. Now, again, it's come down, but the damage to the, to the labor market uh, and to people who um, are not so much in the knowledge sector, not the knowledge workers, didn't have the luxury of working from home in front of their computer has been dramatic. Meanwhile, uh, many of the more affluent in society have done quite well through their investment portfolios. The S&P 500 stock index, the main stock index, uh, is actually back pretty much where it was in mid-February. So even though economies are still deep in the hole, um, financial markets have been off and running. Uh, and within the, that, the IT stocks in particular, stocks like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, um, Microsoft have done very, very well. Amazon is up 47% relative to its pre-COVID peak, 47%. And if you bought that stock at the bottom in March, um, you would have made enormous profit. So there's been a disparity between the way in which this COVID crisis has impacted more affluent knowledge workers versus uh, less affluent, less skilled, perhaps more manual workers who've been just told you don't have a job anymore. Um, so that's really just by way of framing. Um, perhaps just by the final point I'd make is that it seems to me that this COVID crisis has uh, amplified or stands to amplify and exacerbate a lot of the pre-existing trends, particularly that inequality trend, perhaps some backlash against globalization um, and some other political developments we, we've seen. But I think as was mentioned in a, a prior session I was just listening into, it's also exposed the fact that our global economic system, national economic system, local economic systems um, are not very resilient to these kind of shocks. And that's another thing in terms of redesigning the system that I think we, we all need to think about, making sure that it is much more robust and resilient uh, next time. So that's just by way of framing. Um, I'd love to hand over um, 
Perhaps I'll start with you, Senator Brown, just in case you get cut off. Um, you, and, and hand it over to you, uh, Senator Michael Brown, the shadow uh, senator for uh, the U.S. shadow senator for the District of Columbia. An interesting perch in D.C. How do you see all this from your perch? Well, you know, I take a different approach, even though I did study economics as a as, as an undergraduate. But uh, from a political standpoint. What this has done is uncover so many of the inequities that we see in the system. And this uh, uh, gives us an opportunity, I think, to reform things. If you look at the um, Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, you'll see that there was great social change that accompanied that revolution. We're in a similar revolution right now and a technological revolution, which will really uh, do much more to affect the economies of the world than the Industrial Revolution did. We now have the ability to reach out around the world and develop, if, if, if you don't mind the expression, kind of an economic herd immunity to these sort of things. And if the, and if the corona crime, uh, uh, the coronavirus has taught us anything. We are in this together. We're all part of this. And we're starting to realize that, I think. And politically, we need to reach out to each other and see our common interest in solving things like global warming, which uh, global climate change, which no country can do by itself. And we also, as a business, business leaders need to see this as an opportunity, not only to see uh, foreign nations, foreign economies as competition, but to also see them as um, uh, potential marketplaces. You know, I just came back from giving a, um, a keynote speech in, in Hyderabad, India. Everywhere I looked, there were motorcycles. Everywhere. Everybody rides a motor scooter or a motorcycle. At the conference, I met a woman who was in charge of Harley Davidson in India. And I said to her, you know, I've seen literally thousands of motorcycles, but I haven't seen a Harley Davidson. And she said, well, that's because we're brand new in the country. And I thought to myself, how absurd is this that America's largest motorcycle manufacturer doesn't sell motorcycles in a country that depends on them? and uses more than a billion of them a year. And there's many reasons for that. There's there's tariffs, there's all sorts of other trade problems. But these are the things we need to address, and I think these are the things that people are starting to think about. They're starting to see that. We see in the United States, for example, several corporations that have come out and taken action to uh, affect social change. They've changed their products. They've changed their marketing strategy. In the District of Columbia, for example, we had a racist game on our football team where people have been fighting to get that removed for 75 years. But when Pepsi-Cola and Federal Express stepped up to the plate, they changed the name. There's also, uh, you know, you see this in, in all sorts of corporations that are changing their product descriptions, the way they market things. So it's obvious that businesses can be a real force in developing a new world economic order. And I think it's becoming more obvious to people that this is what needs to happen. And we can do it with the technology that's available to us. Look, you know, at the end of the Industrial Revolution, Karl Marx said you needed to own the means of production, right, or that, that you were going to be left behind. Well, you don't need to own the means of production anymore. You can own the technology, and that technology can be spread all around the world, and we can change this. I know we can. Great. And I think that the optimism that's out there. Great. Thank you very much for uh, that, those far-ranging far remarks, Senator. Um, Minister Chelsea, how do you see things? Well, thank you for the invitation, Paul. Um, <clears throat> well, I come from a very small country. Albania is almost three million, right in the middle of the Balkans. And we've been 
suffering dictatorship for 40 years. Now we're struggling to improve. My generation has not seen the war and hope it will not see it. But what we saw this time was unprecedented. An enemy invisible, which was diving the world into a darkness. And uh, we should understand, better understand and realize how it happened. You know, silence, science was caught in, was silent. Big country, well, well developed countries, wealthy countries were tested, and some of them failed the tests. You know, a lot of ambiguity, anxiety, uncertainty dominated the whole world. And what we saw were the institutions, local institutions were tested, but also international institutions were tested. And we saw them, most of them were confused. Many countries failed to properly manage the situation. For small countries that are like us, looking at wealthy, powerful states, when we saw them confused in Israel. But a big, a big reflection and debate should go on because already has started. The economy is facing challenges never facing before, but with the same institutions, for sure we can't manage the problems of the of the future. The challenge now and the question now is, are we going to have the same institutions or we need to reshape, remodel, restructure them? Or maybe we should ask another question. Do we need some of them or we don't need anymore some of them? Or do we need new ones? As I said, we need to understand better why we were caught by surprise. Mm. And if we knew the cause or the damages, the consequences that the coronavirus caused to the whole world, economy, what would we have done better in terms of investing? I mean, the question now is that uh, we need to remodel or we need some new inst institution to challenge. Let me say you something. You mentioned that you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm probably a unique title. I have a unique title, Protection of the Enterprise. Albania is undergoing many, many uh, reforms, education, energy, but on top of that, justice reform. We are not restructuring the old system. We decided some years ago to knock it down and to build up a new system from the beginning because the old system was not effective, was not efficient, was very much corrupted. So we debated a lot. Do we need to remodel the report? or do we need a new one? So we decided to have a new one. Of course, though we, we are undergoing a lot of difficulties, mm. but we were sure that with the old one, you know, as much as you can reconstruct, remodel it, you're not gonna go too far. Right. So this is the big questions in front of us. And we have, and we already know now that it's a pandemic, it's a global one. And let me, uh, let me, should be a global one. Yeah. 
Let me pick up on on on, on something that I think is is a common theme across uh, your two uh, uh, contributions there, which is this 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 gl the global response and the, the need for international cooperation. Um, one of the sort of the, the paradoxes of this whole situation is, notwithstanding that that is the case, the response that we've seen has been very national based. Uh, we've seen the return of borders. Uh, we've seen the shutting down of international travel. We've actually seen borders going up within nation states. In Australia, for example, that's happening. The Schengen in the EU has been under pressure. Um, and there's been generally a, a pullback to, to the sort of the nation state. And I, I, you do, you, maybe I'm missing this, but I haven't seen a, the, 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 the international organizations, whether it's G20, whether it's the WHO that's been under attack, the United Nations more generally, other international IMF, World Bank, stepping up and really um, taking the leadership here. Now, of course, to do that, they do need all the national government demanding that that actually happens. So my kind of question to to both of you is, um, how do you see the role of, of, of global international corporation organisations? Do we need to scrap and build, as Minister Shalti suggested? Do we need another 1944-style Bretton Woods conference with a whole international financial architecture? was put in place. Um, what do we need to do about the WHO? It was very striking uh, that when I looked at the executive board, the governance structure of the WHO, I realized that it wasn't until May of this year that the US actually put its executive director on the board of the WHO, the executive director whose term from 2018 ends in January 2021. So there was a lack of engagement in the WHO from the US pre -COVID. So how do you see that paradox of um, the pendulum swinging almost against globalization, global cooperation, just at the moment that we actually need that response? Perhaps I'll turn back to you, Senator Brown. Well, uh, let me just say that, uh, you know, we need to re-educate people. We need to uh, come to a new understanding. You know, we've seen the populist movement growing around the world. I mean, in the United States, obviously, in South America and Europe and Africa. And we need to, un we need to develop a new understanding that cooperation is a good thing. You know, we don't think that in America. We've got a president who's standing up there saying, America first. And America only. That's the way we need to change that mindset. We need to say, you know, we need to convince people that, look, no single country can um, affect, you know, and change global climate change. We need to work on that together. And that if we develop, if we, if we give the third world, the developing world, our technology, our medical technology, our information technology, our education, and we bring them up, we make better consumers of them. And that's what that's that's where business plays a role, and government needs to play a role in re-educating people. You know, in the United States, we feel at the end of the Second World War, we were more powerful militarily and economically than the next 10 countries in the world put together. So we're used to running things. It's going to take a serious re-education of people in the United States, for example, before we look at the United Nations as a solution. We look at the World Health Organization as a solution. Look what we did. Right away we went, well, we don't believe in them. We're not going to trust the World Health Organization. We're going to do it ourselves. So we need I think that's what we need to do. We need to re-educate people and, and, and get across the point that things are better. The world, the economies of the world are more resilient. They're stronger and they're able to uh, deal with crises like this when we all work together to make that happen. I think it's a re-education process. Great. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, Minister Chelsea, what, what are your views on that uh, particular issue? Um, 
in literacy, it's not a problem, big problem, as it used to be tens of years ago. Now, the challenge is how to relearn and unlearn some things. Rightly, the senator mentioned the education. One of the biggest investments we should do now is on education, on innovation, on science. We proved that how much we need now the science. And we don't have to think twice when it comes to allocating funds. The other thing we should take into consideration is this polarization of politics, local politics. We had a common enemy, invisible economy, whether it was called the United States, Albania, China, England, France, Italy. So we had a common enemy. Unless we understand that common values should bring about a common global fight against this invisible economy, we're not going to go far away. So we need to understand that local politics, but also global politics, should realize that at certain crucial moments, we have all to come, or we have all to come all together. You know, we, we, we saw not just populists, but we saw uh, many parties taking advantages of the situation and attacking and attacking and attacking politics. Why a big compromise should be made in each individual country, but also globally? And that's why the redesigning or probably new institutions should be in place now that we have a new kind of enemy among us. So the challenge is that lessons learned from what happens are very important. Unless we understand and realize much more better what happened, we will not find the right tools and instruments to succeed in the, in the, in the, in the future. But right. change and institutions is a crucial. Right. Thank you very much, Minister. We've got about a minute and a half left. So 30 second answer, if you would, on this topic of redesigning and just staying with this, uh, the, 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 the global governance, the international organizations, etc. how countries cooperate together. If there was one thing that you could wave your magic wand and produce, invent, fix, what would it be? Senator Brown? Well, I think, again, it would be uh, an exchange, you know, uh, more emphasis on organizations that you've already mentioned, like the United Nations and uh, the World Health Organizations and other international organizations, uh, because that really is the hope for our future. And let me just add that I'm here at the Horace's uh, uh, meeting because I believe that this is – this is the most important thing that we can do to change the future is bring people together so they understand each other. Excellent. And the, uh, last few seconds for you, Minister. What would the one thing you'd like to do? Um, there are challenges when you need politician and big debates, political debates. There are challenges when you need strong, professional, very well educated, science to, to, to respond. That's why crucial is designing or probably new institutions to handle particular challenges. 
that's an optimistic note to uh, to end on the concept also that uh, we need to channel uh, innovation and perhaps the spirit of uh, entrepreneurship as well as working with the more formal governmental institutions well we had a couple of glitches there and we missed a couple of our panelists but uh, i hope you enjoyed that rich uh, dialogue and conversation and uh, thank you very much to the two panelists and enjoy the rest of the evening or afternoon wherever you may be thank you very much indeed yes, sir. And thank, thank you, you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You.